I'm TJ Hollow. I'm the Cultural Resources Supervisor for the Eastern American Indians and uh, Manny's Jumanska Museum, uh, which is in Robinson. Uh, I'm a member of the Eastern Band and a member of the Snowbird community. Uh, this presentation is going to be about where I'm from, uh, Chihuahua Valley and uh, the resistance to uh, the removal. Uh, well, you're the shot. Um, there are still uh, quite a few sites left over in, in our part of the world. Uh, Chioa is uh, present day Robinsville, North Carolina, is about uh, 40 miles from where we are now, which is west. Um, and uh, again, part of the Stubberg community uh, is in Grand County, North Carolina. Um, in the time of the removal in the 1830s, uh, you had quite a few different towns there. You had uh, Venicello, you had Tallulah Town, uh, Chioa, and Buffalo Town. And taken all together, uh, the way the uh, things are represented, uh, you know, smaller towns were lumped into large ones, so as a whole, it was known as Chioa. Uh, this photograph here, you, you can barely tell, uh, that little light green bump in the middle of the photograph is Chioa Mountain. Um, in 1837, uh, there was a lot of surveys done. Uh, I'm sure most of the census of 1835 uh, that listed uh, uh, individuals per what river they lived on and their properties. Uh, when they were uh, coming up to Little Creek, they recorded a uh, dance house, uh, as you can see in the, the bottom left quadrant of this. Uh, that area today looks like this. Uh, and short of underwater archaeology where that pond is, because that's the exact spot that the dance house was recorded in. Um, one of the gentlemen that uh, we'll be talking about a lot, his name is Big George. He was the head man of Chioa. He was uh, the town blacksmith. And um, a lot of what happens uh, when the army comes into Chioa uh, centers around Big George and what he's uh, saying and what he's doing at this time. This is what Big George's property looks like today. Um, just a, a field. Uh, there was a mound near his house. Uh, there's a reference in the 1820s referring to the Ocoee District, uh, the North Carolina District of the Cherokee Nation as being the darkest part of the Cherokee Nation, that it was behind the times compared to uh, uh, towns like Minnesota. Um, meaning that uh, the towns were a bit more traditional uh, in its practices. Uh, missionaries hadn't been in, into this part of the world as long. I didn't creep in until around 1820. Um, and as evidence of that, a lot of the headmen of these separate towns still had their homes near mounds. Uh, there was a mound here near Big George's property. Uh, Wachacha in Valley Town, his home was near a mound. And these are things that you pick up on and notice uh, throughout uh, with the maps and with the uh, letters going back and forth. Now, after the treaty uh, in Chota was ratified, um, there was a lot of uh, consternation in the code. Uh, as uh, in, in early 1839, when the uh, terms of the treaty were read at the Coe District Courthouse, there was an uprising led by a uh, civil waker. And uh, of course, Sid Wega on his uh, uh, arrival at Fort Gibson, uh, after being taken out on the removal, uh, tried to start another uprising there himself. Uh, Evan Jones was arrested at this, uh, simply by reading the terms of the treaty. Uh, in 1837, valuation agents, uh, again, with this census in 1835, came through to uh, verify the, uh, the accuracy of the valuations that were made. Uh, Joseph Miller was one of the men. Uh, Nimrod Jarrett, James Love, and James Hare came through. And they were not only looking to, to do that, but also to kind of gauge the temperature of how people felt, uh, how people felt in the valley, and how people were disposed to the situation. <coughs> This will reflect a lot on uh, what y'all have heard up to now and uh, after Tom talking yesterday, that the Cherokees at the council informed the agents they were opposed to moving west 
and that it was a place their fathers and mothers had lived and died in, that their bones were buried there, and they were unwilling to leave the graves of their parents. Now, this is a general, you know, you hear this not just with the Cherokee, but other tribes that were uh, removed or uh, drove, driven off their homelands. Um, and I'm sure Brett touched on it this morning, as Tom did last night, that this is not just uh, where, the, where the parents are sitting about just leaving the cemetery sitting about leaving a graveyard that in Tom talking about Yadua and Yadu 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 that the home where the Creator gave us that this is the, this was the tie this was the connection that they felt and that those bones in the ground proved ownership of the property and that they did not want to leave that because they believed and just as we believe here in the Eastern Band today that we're still here where God put us now, in addition to finding out uh, how people felt, they were also addressing rumors that had been going on in the Cherokee Nation that there wasn't going to be a removal, that there, the army was going to come in and kill everybody, that all this stuff was just a lead up, and this rumor was, was going around. And McMillan writes in his letter that uh, they had to come to them and let them know that that was false, that that was not the case. <laughs> Uh, so this was the uh, the feelings of the people, at least in Chiyo, at the time the army arrives. <clears throat> Y'all just saw this uh, drawing of Fort Butler. Uh, most of the forts in North Carolina, I think all the forts in North Carolina were built on the standard plan. Uh, we see references to that in some of the letters to the army officers. Uh, so Fort Butler looked probably a lot like Fort Montgomery, which looked like Fort Lindsay, Fort Henry, Camp Scott, and on down the line. Fort Montgomery was established uh, in the spring of 1838. Uh, this is a view uh, looking uh, northwest, and you can see uh, right under those power lines is Chio Mound, where I had the detailed photograph of it. And you know, these forts were built up on hills near towns so that they could get a good idea of what was going on. They wanted to be able to see people. There was a lot of anxiety on the part of the United States Army coming into the mountains of western North Carolina. A lot of the soldiers, and as you read in the uh, uh, John Phelps Journal, who was a private of uh, Fort Butler, a lot of the, the foot soldiers came out of Florida, where the uh, U.S. Army was uh, attempting to remove the symbols. Does this seem bad? <laughs> and uh, of course, Osceola pulled into the swamps, and uh, they're still known as the Unconquered Seminoles today. Um, they were afraid to walk into a similar situation here in Western North Carolina uh, with the law thickets, with the steep mountains. And the army was just a little bit nervous. And just so you know, I'm making this up. Uh, the commander at Fort Montgomery was uh, Colonel John Gray Byron. And in his letter on June 2nd, when he arrives at Fort Montgomery, states, I reached my station last night and assumed command this morning and found the post in quite a precarious situation, provided the engine he knew was supposed to be hostile. I love how they wrote that thing. Because basically what he's saying is if the Cherokees don't hear a man, we're in trouble. The first thing he does uh, once he gets here is goes and talks to uh, the headman. He goes to Big George's house. And in this you can see that he says he needs to bring 500 warriors into the field, and that number is within 10 miles of the place. That was a lie. Uh, there weren't 500 warriors in North Carolina. But what's going on here is that the, the Cherokees in this area are very aware of what happened a few months prior in Georgia. And all those horrific acts that you hear about generally come out of Georgia. People with their houses burned down around them as they're leaving drove away from the dinner tables. The people here knew that. And this is Big George posture saying, you're not going to do this. We're not going to stand for that here. And I think uh, Bynum took that to heart. Because when he gets here, the old Marlin Road, as it's called today, was not complete. There were still a few miles left to connect Fort Montgomery and Fort Delaney in Valentine, which we'll see tomorrow. Um, the, the fortifications weren't completed around Fort Montgomery. 
So you see his letter where we're in a very precarious position. The fort's not finished, the road isn't finished, which means the road's not there for the wagons. There's no way to get supplies there. No way to bring in food or ammunition. It's off the pass. So they know uh, that if something does go wrong and the Cherokees do rise up in this valley, there's not a whole lot they can do. They station uh, around 250 soldiers in, in most all of these forts in North Carolina. But in Chiowa, who had a population of a little, a little south of 500 people, you're looking at a soldier basically for every able bodied adult. You know, when you take away about 500 people, you take away the children, you take away the old, and there's 250 soldiers here to start grab, gathering people and bringing them up. Um, on June 2nd, 1938, they begin what they call the roundups. This is when they start going out and arresting people. And at this point is when a lot of people in Chioa go into the mountains. <coughs> we have a, one of our elders that recently passed in Snowbird said that those that wanted to stay got into the woods and those that didn't, uh, the, the, were fine with leaving, already had their feet turned. And with that is, there was no the resistance in that way. Those that were willing to remove, most often had their bags packed and they were ready. Uh, they would camp, up, camp in the valley down below uh, Fort Montgomery and wait. Um, or they, if their home was near the road, they would just fall in line as they went. But as they, as they bring, bring people in, and as people go into the mountains, a whooping cough breaks out. They haven't met that in our hands. And Bynum uh, requests for two weeks that uh, they have a stay to rest. Uh, he he forced the women went home uh, to take care of the children, and they have, their, as he said, their Indian doctors to look after them. Uh, and he's able to buy two weeks for people to heal up. Because he knows also that if people are going to the sick, there's going to be a lot more death in the West than, uh, than what could be otherwise. The one interesting, thing, one of the interesting things about the Bynum documents is that uh, a lot like the Phelps Journal is you see these soldiers that are coming in, and you know they come in as soldiers, as professionals, to come in and do a job. They're going to come in, they're going to remove the Cherokees, open up this country for them, and settle them. Um, and the longer they stay, you start seeing them realize exactly what's going on. And they start to understand that this isn't just an army operation, that they're dealing with people. Bynum starts attending some of the church services that were held in Chile. And <coughs> some of these folks, uh, board splitter, was the preacher for Chio. Uh, and this letter to Preston Sturette, who was uh, the uh, uh, agent in North Carolina for uh, preemption, that uh, he could, when, if, if he saw fit, write letters uh, that would help people to remain, to help make them citizens, to start that process of citizenship that started with the Treaty of 1890. Uh, and these slips were uh, given out and basically making you exempt from the removal uh, if you were deemed too old to go or, or for other reasons. But you see, Bynum not only does this for board splitter and his family, but his brothers and his sisters. And there's this whole list of people in Chioa that he's asking the Army, asking the, ultimately Lufo Scott to, to meet. And uh, of course this is all turned down. And on June 22nd is when uh, about 300 people are taking due south to Fort Wayne. It took about two days to get there. Um, Dr. Riggs has uh, GPSed uh, what's called the Old Army Road. Uh, there's about uh, a little more than eight miles of this on National Forest Service property. Uh, so the roadway is still extant. Uh, in our community, we have a Trail of Tears walk every year as a, as a kind of commemoration in June. And, uh, we take uh, folks, and a lot of times folks from Oklahoma will come over for this. And uh, Brad and Lance both have been there, and uh, we show people where the roadbed was. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a real touching time to see that. 
Uh, this area here is on the Cherokee County side of the Old Army Road, the turnback spot, which was the first place you could turn a wagon around. Uh, you're talking about some really narrow roads. This road was a footpath, and the Army widened, just wide enough to get a wagon. So there's some of these areas, you know, the, the roadbed is very narrow. And uh, as I mentioned, Bynum attended church at Chio with Ford's letter and heard the preaching. But uh, as a reference to that darkest part of the nation, you had folks in Buffalo Town, which is a little west of Chio. And most of those folks hadn't converted. They were still traditional belief systems. And they, they maintained that. So as we get to the last Bynum quote, it says, the Indians of this valley are almost universally of excellent character, except those of Buffalo Town who are incorrigible savages. <laughs> and uh, I guess it says something that as a descendant of those incorrigible savages, you know, that, uh, um, you know they just disagreed with me, I guess, a little bit too much. Um, as for those that remained, uh, one of our head men was Dick Agishka. And I'm sorry about this. I didn't realize until the day uh, that uh, not every computer has Cherokee syllabary in its hard drive. And uh, so you'll see these dots. I apologize for that. Uh, on my computer, it was great. But uh, Dick Agishka was one of the head men of Buffalo Town. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, Jim Peckerwood, his brother. Uh, Jim Peckerwood was a uh, Chief of Santa in Macon County. Uh, he was able to avoid removal basically by hiding in a friend's basement. Uh, they, they hid him that way. Uh, Dick Gishka wasn't quite able to do that. Uh, with these uh, the Treaty of 1819, Dick Gishka sought a preemption from removal and sought citizenship under his father, uh, uh, Woodpecker, who uh, took uh, attempted to take a reservation on. Uh, Cartoon Jay which is in Macon County. Uh, so he can so Dick Gishkas came over to Buffalo Town sometime between 1820 and 1838 um, and assumed the position of rank there. Dick Gishka also has the uh, distinguishing trait of leaving a memorial uh, that is pretty thorough in its detail. Uh, there was memorials left after removal, a lot of them recorded in 1847. And a lot of it is just, we lived, uh, we lived in Chiyo town and today reside in Kuala, uh, something along those lines. But Dickie Giskas gets really to the point and that he and his town had taken in the mountains. Dickie Giskas and his followers were some of those that I talked about. And talks about that there were only two children left uh, out of the population of near 100 people that survived. Uh, and y'all know, you know, just general population studies, you know, if you've only got two children per population, that's not a whole lot. But this whooping cough epidemic broke out severely in the mountains. And, you know, it's kind of reflected in this quote here. <laughs> this is a, one of the many censuses taken by uh, William Holland Thomas after the removal. And it shows where people remained, uh, where, they, where they lived, and where they lived prior to the removal. And of course, you can see his head man, Dickie Gish, his name is right on top. Um, and you can see that a lot of the folks that, if they started in Buffalo Town, remained in Buffalo Town. We also had a lot of folks from Valley River move over. And in, on into the 1840s and 50s. And Lance uh, Green's going to talk about this a little bit later. But that uh, as people came in, as uh, Jim Wasco was able to come back, and North Carolina gave him the land in Chioa in 1847, then his brother came over from Wolfton uh, and, and joined up there, the Chacha. And uh, along with his other family, moved into Chioa. Uh, these folks are really the direct grandmothers and grandfathers of the people who might be. Um, and uh, you know today represents summer, where these incorrigible savages still play football, <laughs> and where we still maintain as much of our tradition as we possibly can. Excuse me.
Thank you.